Hello, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. Consistent with the format of this particular series on underappreciated diseases, this video is meant only as an introduction. In extreme brief, POTS is a syndrome of symptoms predominantly caused by an exaggerated heart rate increase in response to standing. Despite the fact that many have not heard of it, POTS is a relatively common problem with a prevalence of about 1 in 500. It typically presents in late adolescence or early adulthood, and there is an observed female to male ratio of at least 4 to 1. The clinical features of POTS can be divided into those directly related to the cardiovascular response and those whose relationship to hemodynamics is less direct. Cardiovascular symptoms are universal among patients and can include lightheadedness, palpitations, exercise intolerance, and in a minority of patients, syncope. Non-cardiovascular symptoms are not present in all patients, but when they are, they can include fatigue, anxiety, tremor, headache, mental clouding, often referred to patients as brain fog, and a variety of GI symptoms, such as nausea and bloating. It's common for the onset of symptoms to be described as following a viral infection, pregnancy, surgery, or intense psychological stress, so whether this represents a true association or is a form of recall bias is unknown, complicated by the relatively long duration of time that usually passes between symptom onset and a diagnosis being made. The pathogenesis of POTS is complex and poorly understood. There are likely multiple mechanisms which can lead to the syndrome, resulting in a particularly wide variety of responses to different treatments between different patients and more than one mechanism can be present in one person. Some clinicians and researchers describe three subtypes of POTS based on the suspected mechanism in an individual patient. These are the neuropathic, hypovolemic, and hyperadrenergic subtypes. Some POTS experts use these subtypes to guide treatment decisions, while others do not find this to be a helpful framework, partially because none of these mechanisms or subtypes are mutually exclusive and that many patients have more of a mixed subtype. In such patients, it may be more beneficial to holistically characterize the syndrome rather than pigeonholing them into one of the three categories, or so some clinicians think. I don't personally have an opinion on this specific point of debate. When it comes to the diagnosis of POTS, the hardest step is suspecting it in the first place because many doctors are not taught the disease in medical school. But once the disease is suspected, sometimes because the patient themselves has suggested the diagnosis, the diagnostic criteria is very straightforward. The patient should have a sustained heart rate increase upon standing by at least 40 beats per minute if between the ages of 12 and 19, or by at least 30 if 20 or older, plus reproducible symptoms with standing, and an absence of orthostatic hypotension, meaning the blood pressure cannot prominently drop upon standing because, in this case, an increased heart rate is usually an appropriate compensatory response to the hypotension. This last criteria can be a little tricky because the mechanisms behind orthostatic hypotension and POTS can coexist in the same patient, yet by current definition, the two syndromes cannot be diagnosed in the same patient. To document the heart rate increase in places where it's available, a tilt table test can be ordered. Tilt table testing protocols vary between institutions. For example, there is not one specific POTS protocol that everyone agrees upon, but they are all roughly similar. The tilt table itself is a bed in the clinic or hospital on which the patient will lie down and to which they will actually be strapped, mostly to prevent them from falling over if they faint during the test. The patient will be hooked up to cardiac and blood pressure monitors, there may also be a pulse oximeter to measure oxygen levels, though oxygenation is not impacted by POTS. The patient is left fully supine for 10 minutes to establish a baseline heart rate and blood pressure, at which point the table is tilted upwards, most commonly to an angle of 70 degrees, at which point they are observed for changes in heart rate and blood pressure. By definition, a patient with POTS will experience a significant heart rate increase while the blood pressure is usually minimally affected. These changes reverse when the bed is tilted back down. In contrast, 
For patients with orthostatic hypotension, there is also an increase in heart rate, though not usually as pronounced or rapid an increase. But more importantly, from a diagnostic perspective, patients with orthostatic hypotension have a prominent decrease in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Other tests which should be ordered on all patients with suspected POTS include a CBC to rule out anemia, thyroid function tests to rule out hyperthyroidism, and a conventional 12-lead ECG to quickly investigate alternative explanations for lightheadedness and palpitations, like, for example, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. An ambulatory ECG monitor that's worn at home for anywhere from 24 hours to two weeks can better characterize the frequency of tachycardia episodes, and it can also help rule out a diagnosis called inappropriate sinus tachycardia, in which the heart always beats too fast, regardless of position, and which is believed to be a separate clinical entity. If syncope or shortness of breath are prominent features of the presentation, or if there are unusual findings on physical exam, an echocardiogram may be ordered. And where available, autonomic testing might be done, which could include things like a thermoregulatory sweat test to detect autonomic neuropathy, and supine and upright plasma epinephrine and norepinephrine levels, but these specialized tests are readily necessary to make a diagnosis of POTS. When it comes to the differential diagnosis of POTS, diagnoses which can present similarly include orthostatic hypotension, which itself has many different causes, dehydration, hyperthyroidism, the aforementioned inappropriate sinus tachycardia, recurrent vasovagal syncope, deconditioning, anxiety disorders, and chronic fatigue syndrome. Importantly, just as the mechanisms of POTS are not mutually exclusive, these diagnoses are not mutually exclusive either. For example, a patient with POTS might also have chronic fatigue, anxiety, vasovagal syncope, or all of the above. Treatment of POTS is complicated by the fact that despite the condition being relatively common, there are nevertheless no large randomized controlled trials of any one specific treatment. It's generally believed that a collaborative multidisciplinary approach including physicians, psychologists, and physical and occupational therapists may work best rather than a physician helping the patient to manage the disease on their own, but this is not always available. Specific treatments can be divided into three categories. The first category is activity. Exercise training is one of the most commonly advised treatments, but any regimen should initially avoid the upright position and should instead rely on equipment such as rowing machines and recumbent bicycles. Weight training, particularly of the legs and core, may be helpful too. Also, patients should avoid deconditioning, for example, avoiding long breaks in their exercise regimen during periods of cold weather. The next category is volume expansion. The easiest advice here is to increase water and salt intake, sometimes even using salt tablets. IV infusions of saline are occasionally used during periods of particularly bad symptoms. However, routine, regularly scheduled saline infusions are not recommended. Compression stockings can help to prevent venous pooling of blood in the legs upon standing. The medication fludrocortisone, sold under the brand name of Florinef, leads to decreased salt excretion by the kidneys. Side effects include supine hypertension, edema, and hypokalemia, or low potassium. For some patients, focusing on activity and volume expansion is sufficient to control symptoms, but in others, it's not enough. For those, we have the third category, medications that act on the autonomic nervous system. These include midodrine, propranolol, a relatively new medication called evabradine, clonidine, and pyridostigmine. All of these have various advantages and disadvantages. For example, propranolol and clonidine can lower blood pressure, which can exacerbate symptoms of lightheadedness and syncope, while pyridostigmine has significant urinary and GI side effects. Although it might seem like sinus node modification, an invasive electrophysiology procedure to decrease the sinus node's intrinsic firing rate might be helpful, it can actually paradoxically worsen symptoms and can risk making the patient pacemaker dependent. Thus, professional societies recommend against this procedure, even though it seems like it would make physiologic sense to work.
which I think highlights how we don't yet understand the pathophysiology of the syndrome. Finally, there is prognosis. Although the symptoms can be very frustrating and activity limiting, there have been no known deaths directly attributable to POTS. And luckily, most patients gradually improve over time, though symptoms can still persist for many years. That's it for this brief introduction to postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. If you found it interesting or helpful, please consider subscribing to Strong Medicine and checking out other videos in this series.